all the precious truth of your word. We pray that Tom may bless the sh sharing of your word. We pray that Tom may grant wisdom and understanding. We pray that your Holy Spirit be our teacher and guidance, especially for the speaker. And that Tom may encourage each one of us and strengthen us to serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. All right, so here's my plan. Uh, I've got a handful of questions from you that are kind of in the final questions category. We've done this before, so if you've if you've, you're familiar with the way we've done the courses, this is old news. Not a ton of questions, and that's okay with me because I there's also a lot of text that we can talk about. So anyway, I'm happy to answer your questions as my starting priority. And then as we have time, um, and we will have, I think, the majority of our time, the balance of our time, I plan to take us more in the direction of talking about um, the text of Romans specifically. So anyway, let me do that. Let me talk about first these the questions that you had. Uh, the initial question I think is pretty quick. And the, the question just goes based on Romans 6, 5, and 8 um, is identifying, excuse me just a second, is identifying with Christ in those passages um, in his quickening, like coming to life, resurrection, ascension. Does it take the believer into a new, new sphere and begin the life of the, the new man? And uh, my answer would be yes. I think that's it. Uh, that's all I would really do there. So the next group of questions are uh, are challenging, and <laughs> I'll take my time through some of these. But um, the first here, let me share this screen with you also, so you can follow along with the question. Uh, here we are. Yes. Uh, so Dr. Collins reading of Galatians 6.16, uh, regarded as circumcision, this is Romans 2, 26 and 7. Um, how about I put that up there first so that because it's, it's, it's really hard to follow, I think, a train of thought if you're not thinking of the verses. So uh, how about this? The question goes, this statement of Paul, um, Circumcision is of value if you obey the law. If you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Uh, Dr. Collins read this as a hypothetical Gentile Old Testament context, um, but an, a hypothetical Gentile who keeps the law. Nobody ever has. Jesus is the only one. Right. I mean, not Gentile. Um, but Jesus is the only person who has ever kept the law. So Dr. Collins re reads this as hypothetical. Others, maybe I'll say this now, others like Cranfield will read this as a, um, a believer who is a Gentile believer who's obeying the law and therefore by, by their life, they're actually outdoing the Jew. I mean, the Jew is kind of keeping the law in terms of the physical and the, the, the markers of the law, but the Gentile is actually being transformed in his heart. So a Gentile Christian. In order to do that, um, Cranfield has to understand, and he says this, he has to understand this phrase as basically uh, faith in Christ, <laughs> which is a little, a little tough, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know, kind of reading against the text a little bit. So the question here, um, and what, what we were asking here, uh, how did Dr. Collins refer this as hypothetical or understand this as hypothetical law keeping and that person being included in the covenant? I, I think that as I recalled and as I, as I understood what he said, yes, I think that is what he said. If so, how did he get that? In context, circumcision seems to be referring to physical circumcision as a Jew. And I don't know, I'm not sure exactly uh, how he would read this. So what I'll do is I'll just, I'll kind of make my own view. I'm not gonna speak for Dr. Collins. Um, so I'll just say what I think I would do here. In understanding the way this works, whether you're gonna do this as a, a Christian, a Gentile Christian who keeps the law or hypothetical, I think Mu makes a maybe the best argument for the hypothetical view and I would be most sympathetic to the way Mu did this. Uh, Cranfield and Schreiner are both going to go in the direction of the Gentile Christian view. I think I think this has the advantage. I mean, if you just if you if you read it, the most I would say the most natural reading of it is the hypothetical 
uh, the hypothetical keeping the law. Like if, if hypothetically someone could keep the law. The question is, you're going to struggle over here with, you know, how the person can be cir uncircumcised and yet have kept the law. <laughs> and um, basically, I would just understand that to say, Paul is going to distinguish here, you know, the idea of a person keeping the moral demands of the law, as opposed to all of the things like circumcision that are more of signs or even things that are later abrogated in the New Covenant. So anyway, I think if you do that, you can make it work. Basically, the struggle you're going to have, you're going to either need to read this the way I just read it. So kind of impose some kind of a distinction like the core moral demands of the law and not including circumcision. Or you're going to have to read the whole thing somehow and find a way to work this out, keeping the precepts of the law, basically referring to faith in Christ. Um, you know, I mean, do, if I just look at this, and I say, am I a person who keeps the precepts of the law? Um, even as a Christian, I still fail. I still fall short of the law, right? So anyway, I don't know. <laughs> Either way, you're going to struggle a little bit with the reading. But I feel I feel stronger with Moose reading. And I think we're going to end up needing to, to put in some kind of insert, some kind of distinction about what we mean by the law, that there's a way to hypothetically keep the law apart from circumcision. Um Okay, and yes, the rest of the question that you had there, not only Romans 2.26, but also 2.27 would be the hypothetical Gentile. Um, here, a side note regarding 7, 1 to 6. If this is the Mosaic Law, that seems to have damaged the view that no part of the Mosaic Law, even the Ten Commandments, is applicable to Gentiles. Um, 7, 1 to 6 says we're released from the law through union with Christ, not because we are Gentiles. So, yes, I... I mean, this gets complicated, doesn't it? And in what sense are we released from the law? Um, here, this is one of the passages we're going to look at a little bit later on. But if you jump ahead in Romans to, uh, let's see, uh, I'll pull it up here. He, he's going to, he, later on, he's going to cite like multiple um, commandments from the Ten Commandments in support of our need to love. And I'll show you here. Uh, Owe no one to anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet any other commandment or summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that's a reason to love. <laughs> a reason to love is to fulfill the law. And I mean, what, you, what have you just done? You've just listed the second table of the law. Um, so within Romans itself, obviously in other places in Paul's writing, he's going to cite the Ten Commandments authoritatively. So honor father and mother. It's going to be right there as a reason that we ought to do so. Um, so anyway, how do we process our relationship to the law? I'm not comfortable with saying that the law no longer applies to us. Um, I would understand Romans 7 as we're released from the law in the sense that we are released from the condemnation of the law. But, I mean, we're, it's still morally demanding for us. God, it, it reveals God's nature, and God's nature doesn't change, and that type of thing. So I agree with you um, that this would do damage to the idea that the, the Mosaic law is not applicable to Gentiles. I don't agree with that. that I wouldn't agree with that statement. Um, as you said, as you argued. And here, I don't know anybody, you just, as a, the, the condition, if this is the Mosaic Law, I don't know anybody, anyway, I mean, I, I maybe I'm just ignorant, but I don't know anybody that would other, argue otherwise. I think it's, it's pretty clear there, here that this has to be the Mosaic Law. So anyway, but maybe I'm wrong. I may just be ignorant there and happy to be happy to be taught. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it's clear enough that it has to be the Mosaic Law there. Um, here, this is a thicket. Um, it's great. Would you explain the struggle as our having two natures? If the flesh is the entirety of our being, is our new nature also the entirety of our being? In what sense are we a new creature if our sin nature is in all of us? 
Uh, how do you define nature in contrast to one's entire personhood or entirety of existence? How do our two natures relate to 2 Corinthians 5.17? All things are become new. How can we present this to believers in a way that is accurate and both encouraging and warning at the same time? Whew, all right. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of stuff in there. I'm just as I've been thinking about this, and again, I'm happy to grow and be taught and learn from all of you here. So you guys help me out. Um, and ladies, help me out. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be into a two natures view of believers. And the reason here, just as I've been thinking about this and reading about it a bit and such like that, I, I think natures is kind of taking on a life of its own. And it's, I, I don't know where to go in the biblical text, like to define that. So I end up kind of having philosophical or theological concepts that become a light of life of their own. Do you know you can do this? You can take a concept, you can abstract it, and then you can you can use that abstracted marker and start moving it around. And you know, so sooner or later you're you're juggling these pieces around like chess pieces, but they're they're abstract markers for something that was hard to define in the past. And we actually oversimplify what's going on by abstracting it. And disconnecting ourselves from what we were we were originally talking about, um, and I, I'd rather just skip all that. So when I go in the direction of saying, you know, this nature, this part of me, and that other part of me, and that nature of me, and I don't know where to go in the biblical text to to define those concepts. I think I end up playing around with stuff, and then I don't I don't really I lose track of the conversation. I'm not really connected to anything textually and so forth. Um, the closest parallel I could have to something like that would be coming up in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4. And this actually, there's there are hints of this also in Romans. Um, but it's this language. Why? Oh, what's going on? Okay, let's try this. There we are. Uh, this language here, so you know, the language put to death and then down here put on um, but here's what I'm wanting to notice in between. You have put on the new self, which is being rena renewed. Um, and earlier up here, you, you have already died in chapter 2 to the old self. Um, that is related to the Ephesians 4 passage where we have this, you know, you have learned Christ. You have heard of him, about him and were taught in him to put off your old self and to be renewed, to put on the new self. So the old self, the new self. Uh, this is ESV. I think the King James is going to translate this new man, old man. Um, so particularly here, we read these often as imperatives. And I mean, commentators are divided here. If I remember right, I think uh, Hayner takes this as an imperative. Um, Schreiner, in his discussion somewhere else, assumes this is an imperative. Um, I'm getting this from the pillar commentary, and they're going to understand this as indirect discourse. So the idea goes, you learn Christ. You learn Christ, and what you learned was that you did put off your old self. You did put on the new self. They're not imperatives. They're, they're indicatives, essentially. I mean, they're, they're infinitives. But they're, they're events that already happened. You have put off the old self. You have put on the new self. That's the reading here in Ephesians. If you don't do it that way, if you do it as an imperative, you must put off the old self, then you actually have to make a division with your reading here in Colossians. Because here in Colossians, it's, it's explicit. You have put on the new self. And it's explicit in the flow of argument across the passage as well. Because the argument in chapter 2, coming down in chapter 3, is that you have already died with Christ. You have already been raised with Christ. I mean, here you is. You have died. Your life is hidden with Christ. It's already a fact. And I feel like the passages read together more naturally, and there's a way to read them in Ephesians 4 that is following this, this concept. The old self, the new self, is already an indicative. It's a reality that has happened. You have died in respect to the old self. You are alive in respect to the new self. Um, so 
if I was going to summarize that, I would say something like, so the, the ontological reality of our natures is already finished. The ontological reality has happened. We have died with Christ. Um, the ontology now is something that we have to live out or to be true to. <laughs> we have to be true to the reality. I mean, you remember Romans, Paul's argument in Romans. I mean, you have died, therefore recognize, reckon yourselves. You know, I mean, come to terms with the reality. Actually live out who you are. And I think that fits again the flow of thought here in Colossians. Okay, so you have died. Um, and down here, you have put on the new self. The ontological reality is a done thing. Therefore, put to death the actions. And I think the distinction here is between on, so ontology and then the life that you're living out as a result of it. I mean, you have put on the new self. You have died. That's a fact. So go ahead and act like it. Um, and down here, same thing. Put on then... And what he's going to talk about now is is actions, essentially, or, you know, sanctification, living it out. So um, I often will put that down in terms of, like, well, you mentioned 2 Corinthians 5, old things have passed away, all things have become new. Um, I'll put that in terms of, like, an illustration, and you asked how would we communicate this to believers in a way that's encouraging but helps them get there. Uh, I think of like, I'll use the illustration of a caterpillar and then you do the whole metamorphosis thing, which fits well into 2 Corinthians 5. And so it changes. Now caterpillar is changed into a butterfly. Um, caterpillars have one set of behaviors. They crawl, crawl, crawl around and eat leaves. Butterflies have another set of behaviors. They fly around and they suck on flowers. Um, so here's two sets of behaviors that, that arise from their ontology. I mean, but the ontology is deeply linked to this right i mean the caterpillars have the right mouth parts to chew on leaves and butterflies have the right mouth parts to suck on flowers um those are there's ontology that stands underneath it okay so the imagination i would use here is you have a caterpillar that goes through the process now his ontology has changed now he's a butterfly he still thinks he's or acts like he's a caterpillar he's crawling around trying to choose on chew on leaves and he just doesn't have the equipment for it <laughs> it's not working for him it's a terrible experience um and essentially that is the way i'm putting it into colossians 3 you have died with christ you are alive with christ what are you doing <laughs> Um, and anytime you sin, you're pushing against ontology. I mean, it's absurd as absurd as a caterpillar trying to, or a butterfly trying to still act like a caterpillar. You're just not that anymore. It doesn't make sense. And, you know, inevitably something's going to get broken or hurt. Um, to sin is absurd. To sin is always absurd. But particularly for a believer, it's absurdity on top of absurdity. It makes no logical sense, no rational, rational sense at all on any level. Um, and I, th I think that's the way I would go after that. I don't know if that helps any, but I, my concern with like, like it, I feel like if we're doing the two natures, we're, what we're doing is we're collapsing it back into ontology again. So we, we, I think we actually end up pushing against the flow of Paul's logic. I mean, Paul's logic is you are changed. Now live out the reality. But we've actually collapsed it back into where the problem and the struggle I have as a believer is ontological, <laughs> right? I mean, the problem I have as a believer is I still have this, this nature to me. And so I need to get this, you know, my good nature, my bad nature, and I need to make my good nature overcome my bad nature. And Paul's argument is, no, you've changed. Now, what are you doing? <laughs> why, why are you living out contrary to your nature? It doesn't make any sense. You are transformed. Stop trying to act like you're something. You, you That person is dead. That part of you is dead. So don't try to go back to that part of you. It's absurdity to go back there. So anyway, I don't know if that helps any. Um, maybe I'm just clouding, clouding things more than anything else. There was one other thought that was in here somewhere, but I don't remember it. Um, oh, the all things are become new. Thank you for that. I've never... I've never thought about that, um, you know, because we use this, I'd say the place I most often use that text is to try to talk to somebody 
who says, yeah, I believed on Jesus 20 years ago, but you know, their life doesn't match it at all. So this would kind of be my go-to text or something. Um, but the all things are become new is interesting. And like you said, has to be qualified, I think. Um, maybe we'll say something like all the important things are become new. <laughs> anyway, I mean, you are a completely changed person. Your nature is completely different. Um, but I'm just thinking even in terms of we can talk like phenomenology. We can talk about people who go through this process as adults and remember it. I don't. I don't remember it at all. But a person who goes through this as an adult, and I'm thinking of a conversation, I don't know, a week and a half ago, uh, with a pastor who maybe 30 years ago was a conspicuous drunkard and practically killing himself. I mean, just horrible, horrible. <laughs> Some amazing stories. So it's a marvel that he's alive. Uh, his wife is praying for him. He gets saved. And then I just, I was asking him, so, you know, how did your life change? And he said, well, <laughs> this is interesting. So, well, I mean, my desires changed because now I wanted to live differently. He said, but I still wanted beer and I still wanted to go out and party and I still wanted to do all these things. And so he said, uh, the way he said it was, I, I had to struggle through that just like anybody else would. I had to break the habits just like anyone else did. My getting saved did not change my habits. I was still the same person in terms of my habits. And so he had to struggle through coming off of all of that. Well, that makes imminent sense. Um, and to, I think, to set somebody up coming through conversion to set them up, you know, well, you'll get saved and then you, then all of this desire will go away. That's, that's you're going to set somebody up for a crash uh, because they're going to have to struggle through it. <laughs> so anyway, I think that's really, practically speaking, very helpful uh, to recognize that we, we don't set them up just for, okay, everything immediately, you know. We will say your old life is gone, but they are going to have to, there's going to be consequences of their old life. They're going to have to work through habits they'll have to change. It's going to be tough. Um, yeah, uh, just the comment here. One commentator explained that verse that we are a new creature, but not everything in us is new. Yeah, so <laughs> it's good. Uh, good um, clarifications and, and helpful insights. Thank you for that. Uh, okay. Interesting, too, comment here. The two natures is always my view. That's why I was taught it. It's interesting to read recently. The two natures view became a part of evangelical Protestantism when it was influenced by the Keswick movement. It'd be interesting to do some historical, do the history of interpretation. Like, history of interpretation on Ephesians 4, 17 to 24 would be really interesting. Since you can read it as what I said earlier, either you can read it as imperative or indirect discourse, the result of which is either you did die and you, you know, the old man died and the new man came to life, or you, you did put on the new man, I should say, or you can read it as you must put off the old man, put on the new man, which is, I think the way I also kind of grew up thinking that latter way, you must put off the old man, you must put on the new man. Um, and so yeah, it would be interesting to know historically how have people tended to read that. And I think that would probably t teach us something. In any case, I mean, uh, uh, Colossians, I, I, there's nothing wrong with a put off, put on language because Colossians 3 does that. It just does it not in terms of ontology. It doesn't say put off the old man. It says put off the actions of the old man, put on the actions of the new man. And it's and I want to preserve that logic of Paul. Your ontology has changed. Now go live that out. Um, anyway, I want to preserve that logic. Schreiner will read Colossians as the actions, but Ephesians as ontology. So he will, in Ephesians, he'll say it, it means you must put on the new man. You must put off the old man. And he explains that through an already not yet concept. So that could work too. It's a solution. But um, I, I, obviously, I like my way of reading it works. Uh, I feel like it works better, but eh, that's because that's because that's the conclusion I came to. So of course, I like my view. Um, so Dr. Minnick, I'm sure that he, I'm sure that I did not understand everything he was communicating because it was simply new to me. 
Uh, he wrote, mentioned that Romans 8 is emphasizing future Adamic sonship throughout and reclaiming the blessings of Adamic glory that you flow from it. It seems to me rather that the focal point of Romans 8 is more Christ and his glory, which I think goes beyond the restoration of what Adam was before the fall. Also, I've, I wonder if there's an alternative way to legitimately view. Let me pause here first. Um, I think, again, it's bad to speak for somebody else. But I'm just going to guess based on the two lectures he's given us. He would answer this to say, well, Christ as the second Adam. So when you hear this as the Adamic kind of categories, it's because, yes, because Christ does everything Adam was supposed to do and failed to do. And then Jesus, Jesus fulfills all of that. So Jesus is the, the greater fulfillment of Adam. And it's I, you could do this to say it's not so much even that um, Jesus is greater than Adam as much as it is that Adam points to Jesus. <laughs> In other words, like, Adam becomes the lesser because all of it he is is this very dim, <laughs> extremely dim, shadowing, pointing ahead, um, actually contrasting like a foil kind of pointing ahead. So anyway, I think there's a way that he can preserve that to, to preserve the Christocentricity of, of Romans 8 um, just by making Jesus is the second Adam. I think that's the way he would do it. But anyway, I don't want to speak for somebody else even though I just did. I wonder if there's an alternative way to legitimately view Romans 1, 4 appointed as, that language of appointed a son, such as being appointed messianic king. Um, that's interesting. I think, I think what this highlights, and this is just a challenge for Dr. Minnick's explanation here. Um, something's going on there in Romans 1, 4. I was convinced by his argument that we, we can't just, you know, the language, the, le the lexicography of Romans 1, 4, we've got to make it so it's not just appointed, but it's, it's uh, really, or it's not declared, but it's appointed. So we've got to understand that lexically like that. Then we are having to make some kind of distinction. Well, it's not this, but it is this. And um, I think what your point highlights is, you know, once you kind of, well, I, I think he is, you know, we're going to argue between his deity, divinity, and so we're going to make it his, he was physically raised, resurrected, and so now in respect to his entire person, then it, he's appointed as the son in through the resurrection and so forth. Um, once we do that, then we kind of open the door that we can use any number of different distinctions. So someone can just, as kind of as you did, okay, well, what about this? <laughs> so we kind of lose lexical or we lose theological and exegetical controls a little bit. Um, so that's, that's part of the challenge. I'm not sure how Dr. Minnick would reply to that, um, but yeah. So I could see your argument or your point there. Uh, easily. I'll, I'll move on to the next set of questions here. And this was, someone was just asking if I could explain further or clarify further with a double predestination. All I'll do here is to say, I do not, I, I, I don't think Romans 9 requires double predestination. And the answers there go, he in one case is using a passive verb. In the other case, his explanation for this is reference to Pharaoh. And the Egypt narrative and I think by referencing like that he pulls in some of the pattern that's in the Egypt narrative if you go back to the Egypt narrative then you can see a pretty good pattern demonstrable pattern of God um, giving basically Pharaoh rejects Pharaoh rejects Pharaoh rejects and then God hardens or confirms Pharaoh's decision so those are the two points. There's a passive verb. He'll use an active verb of God appointing people to eternal life, but he'll use a passive verb, gives a little bit of an ambiguity, for appointing vessels to destruction. And then the Pharaoh link. And only other thing I'll say there, if you remember the Pharaoh link, um, sometimes if you just read Exodus or the Exodus story in an English text, it, it doesn't fit what I just said. <laughs> you could read it and say, I thought you said this was some clear pattern where, you know, only later does God harden Pharaoh's heart. There's some there's some translational stuff going on there. And so, unfortunately, and I hate doing this, but you actually have to go into some Hebrew stuff 
and get into some verbs and pay attention to some patterns. So anyway, I'm not sure I'm not sure exactly why the translations that it works out that way. Um, but if you if you work through it carefully, I, I think it does support my reading that there is a pattern back there in the Exodus narrative. But you have to kind of get into some details to make it to see it to make it clear enough. And on the last part here, this was just a more general question. Calvinism versus anti-Calvinism and so forth. Um, here, I'll, only thing I'll, I'll give you is, uh, well, here, I'll let you see the question. Um, only thing I'll give you here as far as that goes, I'm just speaking practically, and you're writing to me as a, as a deputy. Um, so I've been there, I love that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you can, you can be asked about this and that kind of thing. But here's, here's an, an insight that helped me, and it helps me still as I'm working with people. Um, I think basically everybody, by just by kind of general, I don't know, osmosis or theological intuition or something like that, try this. Ask any believer, lay person in a church, young believer, person who's walked with God for 40 years and has theological, extensive theological education. But you ask them, um, is there anything in the world that God is not in control of? Or is God in control of the events that are happening around us? And I think every believer says, yes. I mean, if he, if it's something like, you know, here is the entire universe and God is in control of most of it. So we're going to draw a Venn diagram and we're going to say, you know, here, things that God controls. Okay. And so then the way the world works is we have, this is things that God controls. Well, we have this little area down here and this is, the things he does not control. And in there goes the human will or something like that. I mean, if you do that, this don't the, the universe falls apart. <laughs> and I think every believer that that I, I think every believer recognizes that just by some kind of theological osmosis or something. I mean, if God can't control the human will or can't intervene in the human will, what's the point of praying? And you could you could pretend as though, you know, well, look here, most of the universe God controls, but not the human will. So it's just a tiny little part of that. No, I mean, think about in my life, how much of my life is dictated by other people's choices? Massive. I mean, am I like, it's kind of like all the important parts. Yeah, well, you know, God controls the, the trees and the dirt in the sky. You know, the trees and the dirt in the sky don't enter that much into my decisions, to be perfectly honest. It's the people that are killing me. So, you know, it, the, it's the human will that just ends up defining so much of what I do. And uh, to say that God is out of control, God can't control that. Anyway, I, I think 99% of unbelief, unless they're just going in the open theism direction, which is kind of like dead now anyway, um, everybody's going to go, oh, yeah, no, God's in control of everything. And you need to support all kinds of scripture for that. Um, and then you can go around the other side, though, and you can say, so uh, are we responsible for our choices? And again, all the believers, just by kind of a theolo general theological osmosis, are going to say, well, yeah. I mean, it w would anybody sign up for this logic? I sinned, but what could I do? It was the sovereign will of God. And nobody's going to sign up for that logic. You can't do that. It's absurd. Okay, well, when I just put those two things in there, just those two realities, there's a paradox that you will not escape, period. And there's like a very tiny handful of people that will talk as if they've resolved this by X, Y, Z means. I think they're unrealistic. They're not recognizing those realities. Nobody escapes the paradox aspect of it. So anyway, as, as I talk to people like that, I will prefer to not put it into Calvinism versus anti-Calvinism and so forth. Um, I'll express, yeah, I do my best to understand passages as they stand with the recognition that I am not going to be able to resolve these and I'm okay with that. Now, I mean, from there, what we end up with, honestly, is just a question of where you're going to move the slider. <laughs> so if this is the sovereignty emphasis and this is the responsibility emphasis, people are trying to move this slider around. But I don't think the differences are as big as we think they are. I think we're actually like playing around with, you know, we're playing lexical games and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, you'll do things like, okay, people say, well, God knew what we would do. 
in the future and so he elected us on that basis anyway i mean here's i think illustrates this if that's true and he already knows what i would do in the future then it was said anyway <laughs> Right? I mean, it was already a finished deal. It was already done. I was either going to be saved or not saved. There wasn't, in that sense, nothing was pure contingency anyway. In other words, I just don't think we can escape the tension that is inherent in reality. And even however you try to configure it, you might call yourself more Calvinistic or not, at the core of it, you're going to end up having to come back to, yeah, there is no pure contingency in the universe if God is in control and I am responsible. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if that helps. That's the way I've tended to go with this. And then from that, we just get into discussions about details. But if we start with those foundations, most people are going to be on the same page. And from there, we work into how do we read different passages. Uh, I see some chat comments. Let me just make sure I'm, yeah, okay. Great, I'll keep on going. Uh, I think this is the last, no, there's two more sets of questions here. Um, and, you know, I don't know, hearing different questions is sometimes can be helpful, sometimes not, because if it's not your question, it's kind of, you know, you asked a question, you were interested in that, somebody, oh, I'm not interested in that question. So anyway, I, I uh, hope though there's profit in here. The article by J Street, he presents some interesting arguments that we should view Romans as a covenant struggle, old covenant struggle seen through new covenant eyes. Yeah, I've, I didn't really, I wasn't really necessarily convinced by his argument and because as a class, we wouldn't have all read the argument um, or read the article. I don't know that I'm going to go into it too much, except just to say, I think my reservation with it was, I, 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 it's kind of like he has to read the passage through, what do you say? It gives you the sense that um, you come to the passage and then you need to have his article over here in order to know how to read it. Like, meaning, I don't think it, it's it's that compelling of a natural reading of the passage. Um, and with all of the different views, when people get really specific, you know, it's this, this, this. Here's like the three things that you have to know in order to make this work. I mean, he's very specific. It is an old covenant struggle viewed from the perspective of the new covenant. It's very, very specific. And I guess that's the struggle I would have there is I, I feel like he has to put in a grid to make the passage work. And I don't know that it would have occurred to me unless I picked up the journal article. Um, so something that's too nuanced like that or too narrow like that just makes me feel like, yeah, <laughs> um, there are not enough indications in the, the passage to take me there. When I, my immediate intuition when I, when I was thinking about this, okay, why, why am I not convinced? Uh, one of the things that occurred to me is, well, why is Paul saying I? And if you go to Jay's article here, he does end up having to do exactly, he's got to do the rhetorical I. It's not Paul, but it's the rhetorical I. Um, so he does exactly that. And he has to make a couple of other qualifications like that. They just, they just kind of didn't convince me. So... Yeah, that's it. I guess I just found it a little bit too narrow and a little bit too improbable and just wasn't convinced that that was the reading of the, of the passage. But anyway, each, of course, each view is going to say that of the other views. Um, and here, our discussion of Romans 5, the question goes, original sin. It's great, great question. Original sin and the result of that, what about uh, innocence? <laughs> Babies that pass very early miscarriages. Or um, what I get asked every semester in Bible doctrines, usually four or five times. <laughs> uh, what about like a handicapped person, which a person who doesn't have the mental, the mental, you know, the, an innocent in the sense that they don't have the mental capacity to understand salvation, which they just go in the same category as babies. Um, so the systematic theology framework for this, you can't really, I don't think, you, there's not a way to prove this exegetically. The case itself for uh, miscarriages or babies or innocent people. Wait, wait, that's just a language. Oh, they're not innocent, but the language of people that don't have the ability to understand incompetence. That's I think the word I'm looking for. Um, the language, uh, the support for that itself is the fact that they are not going to be condemned. Just that fact is a really hard exegetical case to make. So I think we kind of do it. <laughs> 
I don't know. We do it for systematic reasons, for practical reasons. And I, looking at the data, you know, I think it's fair. I think, yeah, okay. I mean, you you know, you have like the, actually more convincing to me than the, than the David passage is that there's indications that God recognizes, like in Jonah, there's indication that God recognizes there's a different level of responsibility for those who do not write, know their right hand from their left hand. Anyway, I think we know the data and you know we kind of do the best we can there. But as a systematic necessity, what we affirm is every human being deserves condemnation. So I, I'll always emphasize in my doctrines or systematic classes, I just used the word innocence a little bit ago, shouldn't have. It's not that little babies are innocent. It's not that they are free from original sin. They're guilty and they deserve eternity in hell as much as, as, much as I deserve eternity in hell. Um, but the concept of it is systematically we could say God could unilaterally forgive them on the basis of Christ's sacrifice. We, I mean, we do a similar thing with like general... Um, like common grace or general grace that we say general grace is also one on the basis of Christ's sacrifice. The ground for general or common grace is Jesus sacrifice, the grace of that. And so we would do something like that, that their inability to exercise faith for themselves leaves the opening that God can unilaterally apply forgiveness and grace to them on the basis of what Jesus Christ did. In this case, not on the condition of their faith because they cannot exercise it. Um, my understanding of the linkage between faith and salvation is when we're talking about faith, we kind of take that more in like an informational direction. Um, if you have the right information and you agree with it, you're in. I think I would prefer to understand it through, think of like, Romans 10, whoever will call. Uh, Luke 16, the, the Pharisee and the publican, and the publican says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I want to put it in the categories of humility. You're asking for help. Um, I understand the biblical emphasis is on faith, but the concept of faith is you're reaching out. I can't do this. I have no option. Help me. <laughs> so the contrast to faith is not you got your facts wrong. The contrast to faith is an attitude that says, I got this, I'm good, right? Um, and and the, the, the core of faith is going to include information for sure. And, and subscribing, subscribing to that information, agreeing with that information, but also we do this third component of the, the three traditional components of faith, trust. I need help. I don't have this thing. <laughs> I'm not good enough. So if I do that kind of framework here, uh, babies don't have the ability to express that, but I do think there is automatically, I mean, because they don't have the capacity to think that, there's not a self-trust in that. So I think there's kind of a case that could be made that God could unilaterally apply his grace to them. Um, I don't know if that helps any. The last covenant, or the last question here, sorry, uh, by covenantalism. Can I expound more? I don't think I will, just time. I'll just say, um, this is, I don't know that that many people really uh, really subscribe to this. I, I, yeah, I don't think so. I think this is a very odd view. And I, I think more it's kind of like a whipping boy. You know, well, oh yeah, the old, it's kind of like, you know, the old Schofield view that there was a way of salvation through the law. Ah, so anyway, we just kind of mentioned it. I don't, I don't know anybody personally who subscribes to this that somebody was saved in the Old Testament. Um, apart from new perspective people, so and, but new perspective itself is fading. So I don't know that I'm gonna get much profit out of going down there. The gift of prophecy, does it still exist? The options here are to say that we're talking about, like for instance, 1 Corinthians 11, praying or prophesying. You can talk about prophesying as um, speaking or declaring the truth. And so what you're doing is the Old Testament prophet is not just a future predictor, but he's a person who just preaches. And so your understanding of prophesying follows in those categories. Um, I know of good arguments that could be made. I'm not settled on this, but I know of good arguments that can be made that that doesn't, that's, that doesn't really flow. 
when you get into the New Testament, prophesying in the New Testament is primarily used in, in a miraculous sense where you speak authoritatively. And the issue comes here. Is it, possibly, is it possible to make a case from the New Testament data for fallible prophesying? In other words, the idea that somebody gets up and prophesies, meaning they preached or they proclaimed a truth, but they're gonna slip, they're gonna slip sometimes. They're not gonna get it right sometimes. And uh, I have good friends that would argue here, and I, I think it's a pretty persuasive argument, that the New Testament pattern is when a person prophesies, they're enabled by the Spirit, they're gonna fulfill like the Deuteronomy kind of standard, that they're not going to make mistakes. <laughs> So you don't expect somebody to prophesy, meaning they preached, but they interpreted a passage wrong, or they said something that wasn't true, they messed up, slipped up here. Um, anyway, when you put it into that kind of grid, I, I think there can be a case either way. So I grew up in my context where I was taught and so forth, I was taught prophesying being when you get up and preach, or somebody, you know, a lady can stand up and share a testimony. and that is prophesying in the sense that she's proclaiming or speaking truth. Um, but the more I think about it, I'm kind of moving in the direction that New Testament prophesying seems to be something spirit empowered that is um, what I, just supernatural and therefore something that has ceased. But I'm still thinking through that. I haven't come to a settled conclusion on that. Happy for your input in the chat if you, if you have thoughts there or if we wanna think further down that direction. Um, okay, if there, that's all the questions I had here, and I can pause there if we want to further discuss any of those questions, happy to. Otherwise, what I think I would do is just wrap up the last little bit of Romans 11. Okay, yeah, inability to exercise faith themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, and it's interesting. I'm kind of arguing against myself here, but uh, you know, I talk about inability to exercise faith themselves, and I talk about faith in relation to information and stuff like that. That is part of the link, right? I mean, they don't have the the cognitive ability to understand the information. So in that sense, they don't have the cognitive ability. Even my daughter's two and a half, um, and she doesn't have the cognitive ability to comprehend. She knows She knows that she is a sinner, that she does bad things. She gets ethics. She gets ethics. And she gets that she has a problem. I'm convinced by that. She convinces. She knows that something's wrong and, and that she does bad things sometimes, and that's a problem. So anyway, she gets that. But to kind of to get the concept that God is the solution to that problem, she's just not there yet. I mean, we're not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to, I, I, can, I can get her to say words after me. But she's not going to be, she can't get those concepts. So anyway, the ability to express, Lord, I can't do this. Please, you, will you help me? Will you save me from, who will deliver me from this awful situation I'm in? You know, she just doesn't have that ability. So it's just, I just don't have the cognitive capacity to comprehend that. Well, that I think is my link or my way through this. I don't, I, that sense of desperation, I think, is the core of faith. And she just doesn't have the ability to do that. Um, where we had, I had left stuff last time was just towards the end of 11. And if I can get away with it, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to talk just a little bit through 11 and then I think we could take our break. I don't see anything else in the chat. So anyway, let me speed talk through the last part of 11. And then after the break, we'll try to hit the, the future or the following chapters. Um, one or two things I wanted you to know here, as far as this illustration goes, it's helpful, I think, to know the Old Testament precedents for this. Here, I'll take this off so you can see where we read it. But anyway, so you know that there is Old Testament precedent for the language of an olive tree and branches. You can do more than that. You can do Isaiah, um, like the concept coming out of Isaiah 5, and it's the Israel as a vine. If you do Israel as a vine, it's huge. So these are specifically, this is how much it happens. This is specifically olive tree language. But if you go past olive tree language and you'll do Israel as a vine and you, you want to chase out like Isaiah 5, back, that goes all the way back into the Torah. I mean, that goes back, way back into Exodus. So however, however you do it, the concept of Israel as a plant that God had planted and that then has not 
prospered, but by no fault of God's, by Israel's choice. If you do that, then you've got a lot of Old Testament precedent for this. Um, notice I, I twice highlighted orange here, arrogant and proud. And um, that is the concept down here. The idea speaking in terms of groups, in terms of groups of people, I think his argument is don't in any way start to assume, well, my group is the in group. <laughs> like, good thing I'm a Gentile because this is the Gentile era. Nor, good thing I'm a Jew because this is the advantage Jews get. That's the whole argument of it. And you can see if you get down here, um, verse 22, note then the kindness and severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Uh, if they could be cut off because of their sin, well, then who do you think you are? So anyway, the argument in it throughout is specifically against any sense of salvation by DNA or salvation by group. I'm part of the group, therefore I'm okay. Interesting here that you're going to do, you know, essentially the exact opposite, I think of the way that uh, the new perspective is going to go. I mean, there is a, a very real sense here of just going directly against that. Don't think just by being part of the in-group, you're gonna be okay. Um, and then we have a couple of, uh, this is intertextuality here. Um, and yes, here we go. Uh, context here taken from Isaiah 59. So anyway, this is just the context. New Testament contexts here that are supporting some of this. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days. I will put my law within them. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's what we're getting here. Messianic contexts and new, new covenant contexts to finish that out. Um, all right. And then I the last is I'm just going to jump ahead the last set of intertextuality 33 to 36 if you chase out the intertextuality here you're going to take you're going to be taken back into Job and into Isaiah um, if you notice the riches and wisdom and knowledge language up here uh, these are all linked to just to emphasize the the richness of God's wisdom the richness of God's plan Way up, you're going to get, I think, it's the final section of Romans to the only wise God. And I think that's an echo of this. But in any case, all of it is to say just the, the inscrutable beauty or the richness or the complexity of God's plan. Who could possibly know or question who could say to him that you've not followed a fair or a just method in what you've done here? And I think that fits the logic earlier. It's kind of a recovery of chapter nine. Remember, chapter nine, shall the potter say to the, or shall the pot say to the potter, why have you made me thus? Um, here's the wisdom of God and the richness of what he's done. And his wisdom is utterly and entirely beyond our understanding, but greater and more beautiful than we could imagine. Because, verse 36, everything returns back to him. Um, from him, source, through him, so preservation or maintaining, and to him, telic or final end. So from the beginning through the present, all the way to him in the end, all things are to him and to his glory. And that's the way the section ends out. Um, that's one, one through 11 is the doctrinal section. And my plan when we come back is to just hit the beginning 12, 1, and 2 as a transition that takes us into the practical section and then do what we can talking through the, the remaining chapters, just kind of speed talking or flying through some of that. Um, I don't see anything in the chat just right now, so I'll pause us now and we could come back in five minutes. Let's just come back at like five minutes after the hour uh, on Philippines time 9.05 and then we'll pick up here with chapter 12. And if you have questions about some of what I skipped there in chapter 11, let me know in the chat and I'm happy to go back and hit some details, things that I jumped over. So, okay, see you all in a bit. Let's start, I'm starting in Romans 12 now. Just a opening comment about that. I think you recognize that you have a massive shift in 12.1. And um, well, anyway, let's read it for starters. 
Um, this follows the Pauline pattern where you've shifted from theology now to practice. And so 12.1, well, there's a couple of markers here that support this this shift. One is that this has the quality of a doxology, right? I mean, so just what came right before, a moment before, is this kind of this sense of being climactic. Okay, and then from him to him, through through him to him are all things. To him be glory forever. That sounds like it could be the end of a book. Um, so that gives you a very strong sense that there's something structurally going on here. Something just got right. Uh, just stopped here. But then you keep on going. I appeal to you, therefore. Uh, the therefore gives you a sense that you've shifted. This is an explicit statement of what we're doing, that we're moving now to something practical, application-oriented. And then just the thickness of the imperatives, right? Do not be conformed, be transformed, even present your bodies. Um, so the thickness of or how many imperatives there are in a short span tells you something has changed. And then finally, I would say just how general this is here at the end, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, is a pretty good statement of saying, okay, now I'm shifting to something, something practical. So anyway, if I put all of that together, I think there's a very easy case to be made here that this is a shift from the theological basis to the practical. And we know this, this is a Pauline pattern. Like, you know, you see this in Ephesians, most classically Ephesians one to three, four to six, super clear, the notion of you set your theological foundation and then you build out your practical living on the basis of that. But we see this other places, Colossians, and even, even books that kind of mix it up like 1 Corinthians, I argue that 1 Corinthians is just doing this with each issue. With each issue, he has theology and practice, and they're all intertwined, but they're moving together. And yes, your practice follows on your theology. Okay, so that's kind of the, the structure of what's happening in the book at large. Um, this is something I created in another context. It was at BJMBC, but since I have it, uh, we'll read the passage this way. So the way I'm just reading basically through the words, because of the mercies of God, and this is a bit of a paraphrase, because of the mercies of God, you must present your bodies as sacrifice. Uh, what kind of sacrifice? Living wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be here because of the result of that. So this is as a um, this is as an, a summary of it, and now we're going to say it more specifically. Here's contrast: Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind for this purpose that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And if I was summarizing those two sides over here, because God mercifully, mercifully saved you, you must give your whole life come to him completely. That's the sense of a living, living sacrifice. Your life is now the sacrifice of worship. Over here, don't let the world control your thinking. Let God transform it so that you can know how God wants you to live your life. Um, so a couple of things to say just building those ideas out further here. This definitely is a way of summarizing everything that came before. So, you know, basically all of Romans now, 1 to 11, is summarized under this heading, the mercies of God. Um, because you can just go through those chapters and see the rich mercy that he's brought about, that we have life. <laughs> and um, that as a summary of his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, all of the salvation that's described in the earlier section of the book. The language here, presenting, sacrifice, uh, acceptable, reasonable service, there's like five different words in here or something that are, the commentary of literature will say, the cultic context. Of course, when we say cult, and especially if you say that like in a popular context, people are going to hear that as some, meaning something different. But the sense of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, Anyway, what's interesting about it, though, recognizing he's using a metaphor of Old Testament sacrifices, but he's pulling that into New Testament living. <laughs> so before, you know, here all across the book, he's going to, he's, he has said things about, like what we were talking about earlier, chapter seven, you're, you're set free from the law. Um, he's going to talk about our not being under the law, but 
what's so striking about it is that all throughout he's going to have, as we've seen, an immense amount of intertextuality. I never appreciated before working on this book how much intertextuality, how often he's talking about Old Testament texts. It's just everywhere, constant. And here even, the way that he describes the how I ought to live, what does my life look like as a Christian, as a believer, what do I do? He draws that from Old Testament context and Old, Te Old Testament content, and it's specifically aspects of the law that have been abrogated. Meaning, you know, we no longer go to the temple, we no longer make sacrifices. Um, but he is saying, just like that happened, now that's how you're supposed to live. Meaning, what he's affirming here is the ongoing utility of Old Testament literature, specifically even Old Testament literature that has been abrogated. And the exact opposite of saying something like, uh, okay, now since you are in the New Testament, then you don't even need to worry about that stuff anymore. You know, you could just cut it out of your Bibles, forget those pages. I mean, he's, it's like he's theologizing on the basis of some of that content. Paul, ironically, bef you know, before we view Paul as anti-law, antinomian or something, Paul ironically does the most of this. Oh, well, you know, you can say, well, of the New Testament epistles, he basically writes most of it anyway. But, I mean, he he's the one that in later, like in 1 Corinthians, he's going to say, <laughs> when God talks about don't muzzle the ox, you don't think that's about oxen, do you? That's about... That's about a general principle that applies to why we ought to feed our pastors. Um, so he's going to draw very specific applications pulled out of Old Testament content. And I think that's striking, particularly like as we say here in this epistle, where we might assume that he's going anti-law here. Um, good. Uh, the comment in the chat here, and correct. So... It's an interesting too. He, the chat just pointed out, yeah, and it's a living sacrifice, precisely. And it, I mean, this is part of the interesting thing is, um, on some level, the Old Testament sacrifices, you know, once and done. Well, I mean, not really. You keep on having to do the sacrifices, but you kill the animal and that one's done. And this is the living sacrifice, which is to say, it's parallel but different. And I, I would like to argue that this fits my my overall vision as far as thinking between the, the testaments goes. Um, here is the way I think we, we might tend to think about the relationship between the testaments. We tend to think of, okay, uh, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, here we go, try again. New Testament. And so the, the idea that Paul is teaching us here is that Old Testament, it's out. This is where it's at. And I think a richer framework for thinking about it and a, a more biblical framework for thinking about it is going to be more like worst arrow ever. But Old Testament progresses into the New Testament and the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Okay, so that, that word fulfill is really just growingly. Um, that's going to be, that's going to be my understanding, I'm saying, growingly. I've come to appreciate how rich and how thick and how critical that idea is. Matthew 5, 17, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Uh, Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. It telic sense, you've arrived here and now here's the end. Jesus has fulfilled the law. And then if you go like to Hebrews, the concept of better, um, you have to be careful with the better so that you don't end up with the Old Testament is bad. But you do end up with the idea that the Old Testament is a partial pointer, but it's not complete. It's like a symphony that stops at the last chord. You didn't quite get the last cadence. And so it leaves you hanging. Um, and if I, if I go down that direction, I think that's helped me appreciate more the way that Paul and the New Testament are arguing for the Old Testament. So yes, from the chat and your comment there, you know, a living sacrifice, it, I think it encapsulates how you can draw or theologize from the Old Testament, but you must progress on it. <laughs> it's in keeping with the Old Testament, but it's a further iteration still. And that means that I am, my life is a sacrifice, but uh, it's not just a once and done thing, but it's an ongoing daily sacrifice. So every day is 
me living out my life as a sweet savor before God. Uh, this reasonable service language, service has that kind of cultic, that religious or um, temple practice kind of context for it. But the reasonable is kind of the concept, uh, I, think the, I think the King James will say spiritual service of worship, something like that. Um, so they're capturing the worship side of it. But the reasonable side, there's different ways you can read this, and I think they're going spiritual with it. I would prefer to go this way. Hey, this is only sensible. God has, God has provided for you this rich salvation. I mean, therefore, it's only like basic and sensible that you would live your life fully for him. Over here, older commentators tended to trans, uh, or tr trended to contrast between conformed and transformed. And I think recent discussion on this basically says, mm, no, they're essentially the same ideas. He's using two slightly different words, but I mean, even if I say conformed, transformed, I'm not sure as an English speaker how much I would go after the difference between those. <laughs> so you can kind of, uh, yeah, maybe, right? But not really. And I think that's more what Paul's doing here. I don't think the highlight is on the difference between those. It is to say, however, that to be conformed to the world is the opposite of, of renewing your mind. And over here, renewing your mind is... It's going to be proxy for your whole person. Your whole person has to be transformed. But there is a there is a legitimate New Testament concept. Not that we want to make salvation um, an intellectual thing. It has to be a whole person thing. But there is an intellectual concept that it starts with truth and the truth of the gospel. And then that truth working itself out in your life becomes affecting all of you. So I do think there's a legitimate concept. I mean, we don't just want to take mind and cross that out and turn that into whole person. Uh, there's a legitimate reason he's talking about renewing your mind. And this has echoes of 420, or Ephesians, excuse me, <laughs> Ephesians 421, uh, you have not so learned Christ. Um, there is in that four, Ephesians 470 to 24 passage, a lot of emphasis on mind and understanding. And I, I, so I think that kind of concept fits in here. And the last thing I'll say about this passage, um, prove what is the will of God. I think in your proclamation or helping people understanding this, uh, will of God has taken on such a life of its own that like the only time we talk about will of God now is that we talk about like, you know, what job should I take? And uh, that's just terrible. Um, so anyway, to talk about will of God what what has grabbed my mind and as a way of just expressing what helps me remember it what does god want what does god want me to do what's pleasing to him so anyway that's very broad now and it's not just do i take this job or do i move to that city it's how do i live or i mean it's right here in the passage what is good and acceptable and perfect to him what does god want me to do and therefore, I think that opens the full door for the rest of 12 to 16 and all of the applications of the New Testament. How then ought I, how then ought I to live, given the gospel, given 1 to 11, and all the theology of that? What does that mean for my life lived out in, you know, the family and the church and government and relationships with other believers and everything, everything else I do? How does that work itself out in all of those contexts? So anyway, um, I, yeah, that's all. I would just emphasize here kind of the concept so that you can know how God wants you to live your life. The will of God, what does Christian living look like? <laughs> what does God want us to do? Um, versus just the way we, we tend to default here, which is kind of like guidance language. So um, living sacrifice. I don't know, Brother Kenneth. I... I, I would not view this passage, living sacrifice, I would not view this as fulfilled Christ, per se. I mean, Christ is the sacrifice. Christ is the Passover. But because of the language, the language requires me to go, you must present your bodies a sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. So now, there's this broad biblical theology pattern that's pretty interesting here. Um, let me think what example I'm gonna, well, I mm, I did this with you guys before when we talked about the rock. Let's see how quickly I can pull that up. Um, but you remember this pattern we did the, we were, I was talking about the rock, God is the rock, 
Jesus is the rock, and therefore we are, in some sense, living stones. Uh, I'm not seeing it right away, and I'm, I'm, I'll waste time trying to find it, unless here. Um, so anyway, the, the kind of the flow of that thought is God, Jesus, believers. And you'll see this in other places where, let's say, like, God is the king of the universe. God rules in heaven and earth, kind of like, let's say, in Daniel. The Ancient of Days sits upon his throne. But then the Son of Man comes before him, and to him is given dominion, kingdom, and authority, that all peoples, nations, and languages should be given to him. And then the last part of the chapter, but believers also reign. So you have that kind of same concept. God is the king. Jesus receives kingship. We receive kingship in relationship to Jesus. Um, and the significance of that flow of thought is, number one, God, Jesus. Jesus is God. <laughs> so there's a deity of Christ link. And, I mean, I, I, the more I work on different biblical theology topics, I'll be astounded to find this pop up all over the place, this exact framework, God, Jesus, believers. So that link, what is true of God is true of Jesus. And then we move what's remarkable now, the next part of the link, Jesus and believers, that part of things um, stands there because of our union with Christ. So it's a union, that, that side of it is a union with Christ emphasis. Um, and I think then you probably could do something like that here. If I'm looking at this, Christ is the sacrifice, but that means that we are living sacrifices, not in any exact parallel to what he did obviously the sense that he did it different from ours um but christ as the ultimate sacrifice and then now that means that our lives are lived out in that parallel in that pattern so anyway yeah for what it's worth i think i can do a biblical theology framework like that um yeah as in points to christ good so our our lives have to point or our, what it, our lives have to be a continuing echo or something like that so, great. All right, I'll keep on going then out of uh, chapter 12. Here's something I'll emphasize first, or just a pattern I want to show you first. I was astounded. So I've talked to you before about intertextuality in Romans and just how much Old Testament to New Testament stuff we have everywhere all the time. Um, so I went through, though, and what I started highlighting here with a little hand emoji, well, that emoji, um, is all of the Pauline intertextuality stuff. So we can do Old Testament, clear enough. But there's a bunch of stuff in here, as, as I was reading, it was just kind of astounded. Like I would read along, and like, oh, that's 1 Corinthians. Oh, that's Ephesians. Oh, that's Galatians. Um, I said, like, a long time ago, one of the introductory lectures, I think it was like our first lecture, Romans and Galatians are deeply parallel in the sense that Galatians is like the short form of Romans. Um, and so that's a thing that comes up and is astounding to see. But anyway, I just want to run through here and look at some of these where you see the emoji. Um, here, this is one body. We have many members. That sounds like 1 Corinthians 12. You can also do like Ephesians 4, but particularly 1 Corinthians 12 because it links out to gifts. Uh, here, bless those who persecute you. <laughs> this is an interesting one. This is echoes of Luke 6 and Matthew 5, 44. Jesus. So anyway, there, there's a couple, a handful of places in here where Paul is doing some intertextuality from Jesus' words or from the Gospels. If I get down here, this sounds like Titus 3. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. There's a couple of words that are in parallel with Titus. Uh, here, owe no man anything except to love each other. The one who loves has fulfilled the law. And again, at the end, love is the fulfilling of the law. That's almost exact wording to Galatians, Galatians 5. Here, this sounds like Ephesians 5 and 1 Thessalonians 5. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Uh, the night is gone. The day is at hand. What you've got in that is waking, day, light, as well as that linked to moral actions. So living in the light, walking in the light, that kind of language, uh, sounds like both Ephesians 5 and 1 Thessalonians 5. So anyway, again, uh, some strong parallels there. Um, I don't know what this one was. I put it there, but I don't even remember what the intertextuality link was. So I don't know. 
All right, and maybe I stopped there. Yeah, I think I stopped there. Um, anyway, uh, just walking through those, I thought that was interesting just to kind of see this come up. How many times you got the sense that there's there's links out to other passages, and I kind of half wondered if maybe, well, anyway, the, the date of Romans is before some of the epistles, but after others. So it's, it's not like he's, it's, it's not one of the latest epistles. Um, it's later-ish, but obviously like 2 Timothy and later epistles. Anyway, I don't know, is it because Romans is so long? Um, they're definitely, oh, well, this is a huge one, Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 12. There's definitely a sense in which you feel like maybe Paul took some of the, the content, the thought, the ideas that had become part of his theology in another context, and he picks it up and uses it again, but it's used in a different way in Romans 12. Um, so, or Romans 14 that was paralleling 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 and stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, a grid or a category that was helpful to me on this in the in the discussion of synoptic literature, uh, one of the things that gets pointed out here is, you know, we have slight differences, like, let's say, Sermon on the Mount. Um, you know, you can go to Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, but then you go to the Luke record and it's really different. It's just the ordering is different and everything like that. So anyway, if you're wanting to tear up the gospel documents, then you can go through and say that Luke recorded something wrong or look how much of an editorial role that Luke played in re reworking this material. I think the framework, the, the discussion that happens among conservative commentaries in those contexts is, hey, if you're an itinerant preacher, then you end up reworking and reusing content in new contexts. So, I mean, I just, I've done that several times in our discussion here in these lectures. I've pulled in diagrams that I used in a class completely separately. I mean, like, I think the rock diagram, I created that around 1 Peter because I was preaching in 1 Peter. And so I kind of got into it because of that. Um, but then later in this class, it comes up and, oh, interesting. So you're actually coming at it from another direction. And uh, one of the things I realized here watching Paul or watching Romans is to realize that's what's going on here. What's going on here is he, you know, as an itinerant preacher, he has different pieces of content and uh, I don't know, and different discussions and theology that's developed. I mean, you can imagine him going to a church and preaching some of these concepts. And then in another context, he preaches it in a different way. And so then he writes a letter to Rome and there's a certain set of needs and concerns and so he uses some of that content, but he reworks it, applying it to their situation. But then you come over here and he reworks it, applying it to that situation. Um, is there a lesson in this? The notion that some of these, like, like you know what, what I mean, I'm talking ahead of myself, that the New Testament is set up in such a way to show us windows. This is not accidental and it's not, it's not excess or it's not just um, you know, wasting words superfluous words, but it's set up in such a way that we can see how a pastor would pastor Corinth and Rome, and it would be different because the needs are different, but the underlying theolo theological core is the same. And be part of the lesson of saying here that true New Testament theology is such that, it, that the same core concept can be applicable to a multitude of different needs and situations. And we are watching that happening so that the overlap between the different epistles is part of teaching us practical theology, <laughs> how you can understand rich theological concepts and find yourself applying that to all kinds of different situations in life or in ministry. And, uh, and those same concepts are workable in all those contexts. So anyway, I thought it was interesting just to appreciate the intertextuality between the books and that this is not accidental and that there's almost kind of echoes of the synoptic phenomena, phenomenon that are happening. Um, as well, you can just see, I mean, it's obvious enough that Romans 12 moving on is going to go into discussion of gifts. And uh, I can put this up here so we can kind of be seeing the text. But um, uh, one or two things I think to highlight in this is that he's going to significant 
in this discussion is going to be pride. So do not think highly of yourself, more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Um, but the contrast or the antidote to pride, love. So the next part of it, verse 9, and then against verse 10, love one another, which is going to anticipate what's going to come a little bit later in 13, uh, oh, no one anything except to love one another. So I think this is anticipatory, the concept of love. But love is the antidote as the antidote to pride here. This language is, as I said, uh, very parallel to the, the gifts language in 1 Corinthians 12. The only other thing I'll comment on here, I think, is right here, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. I think Schreiner will say here, uh, like God has given faith or a measure of faith to each person. And so he's going to read it as, you know, some people have more faith than others. I think I found Moo's reading more helpful here. Uh, just with the, the kind of idea, God has measured out faith to all of us. The parallel notion would be in 1 Corinthians 12, the one spirit given in diversity. So we have unity in diversity. It's the one spirit given in diversity. All right. It's one faith. I don't mean by that, like the pastoral epistles, the faith, but I mean faith. It's the, the one gift of faith. Salvation by faith, kind of a Romans 4 kind of concept. Salvation by faith. It's the one faith that is measured out or given to each one of us. So it's not like you've got, you know, you know on a score of 1 to 100, and then um, you've got a 74, but your friend has a 78, and your other friend only has a 62. It's not measured out in different measures, but it's God giving out faith. And there's enough room in this word measure that you can get away with that. So anyway, Moo has a, a discussion on that that I think is a little better than Shriners and, and helped me there. Um, but yeah, here parallel to the measure of faith, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. I don't think it's how much grace, but it's the, the, the way that God has graced us, <laughs> what he has given to us. All right, that's it. We talked about that with Dr. Olinger a good bit, so I'll keep on going unless you have questions about it. Um, I thought this was interesting here, and I, I put this, or I wrote this out a different way just because it helped me process it. Uh, but I put little purple circles by each one of these, these commands, and uh, that kind of grabbed something for me just to realize how staccato the commands are. I mean, so what? We could count like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, in verse 9 to 13, I came up with eight different commands. And so it kind of gives you the bang, 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 bang feeling in this section. And it just keeps on going down here, verse 14 down to 21. Um, what this feels like to me is 1 Thessalonians 5. Do you remember this section in 1 Thessalonians 5 where it's like, um, pray without ceasing, rejoice always. You know, I, I, don't, I don't remember the rest of the commands, but it's like 10 commands in four verses. That's the way this feels to me, uh, just because he's, firing these commands out so quickly. There is structure within them, uh, and that some of this is disputed as far as how you want to break it out, but I think verse 9 to 13 is more like uh, relationship in regard to believers, and 14 down to the end, 14 to 21, is more unbelievers and that you don't retaliate. So when you're facing persecution. Um, so anyway, you have the concepts like verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, and uh, never avenge yourself, verse 19, because God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Uh, this language in verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. There's intertextuality there coming out of Proverbs and Jesus. Jesus has language that sounds a lot like that, as well as up here what I showed you before, verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless them, and do not curse them. The link between that then, 14 to 21, do not retaliate, there are strong links between that and the next section, which is the relationship to government. Um, and the links here are going to go specifically, so you, know, you see repay, vengeance, do not retaliate. Well, if you get down here, then you're going to see some of that same language. I'll, I'll highlight it so it's, it's easy to see. Avenger, um, the person who he actually retaliates rightly. The authority actually rightly is dealing with you. 
And there's links like the word wrath, good and bad. So anyway, I think that that's probably the tie between these. Up here, do not avenge yourself. God is the one who takes care of that. Down here, the human authority has a role as an avenger dealing with you when you sin. However, the link is more than that. Up here, don't avenge yourself because I am the one, God says. I will do it. It's God who takes care of avenging. So as I face persecution that's unfair around me, or as I deal with something and you know, my sense is, it's not right, I don't deserve this, and so The answer is, well, there's a God in heaven. He takes care of that. When I get down here, the reason that I submit to governing authorities is because it's God who stands behind. So it's actually the same thing. I don't take vengeance for myself because there's a God in heaven. I'm going to let him take care of that. And I do submit to them because God stands behind them. <laughs> so um, just notice then the, well, I just highlighted again in red, I guess. But the green, I highlighted the green here to, to highlight for you. You know, we're talking about government. But his whole logic goes government, but behind that, the authority of God. So to resist the government, you're resisting God. That's very striking when we just recognize his context. Nero is on the throne. Um, so we're not talking about a benevolent governor, government at all, a good government at all. Nero is ultimately going to execute Paul. Um, you know, anyway, we're talking about a very wicked government. Uh, and yet, even in that context, he can speak that way. We discussed this passage a bit in uh, our practical theology class. And uh, so we use this as a case study. Yeah, good. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting myself. But uh, the imperatives, there's some complexity because some of those are participles. But I call them imperatives because essentially they, they end up having the flavor. Of, they're participles, but they end up having an imperatival flavor. And then correct, yeah, vengeance mind drawn from Deuteronomy. So another just constant intertextuality. It's 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 pretty neat to see. Um, great, good, thank you, thank you for those comments. Good, helpful. Uh, so what I was gonna say. Um, oh, we talked about this in terms of practical theology, and I find this fascinating. Right, we talk about theology developing over time, and so sometimes situation or context raises new issues in theology or makes us go back to the text in fresh ways and have to reconsider the text in fresh ways. And I'm really fascinated that in uh, 2020 slash present, um, we have to reconsider this passage again. <laughs> we're kind of exploring this passage again, you know, something we thought, okay, worked out our ethics on that. And now then this is back up in the air again specifically because you have contexts where uh, people feel like the government is overreaching through quarantine by shutting down churches, being inconsistent because they let bars or nightclubs be open, but not churches be open. So you've got a handful of churches, mostly in the U.S. and Canada, that have gone big with this, uh, like a, more of a civil disobedience thing. And anyway, I'm happy for, uh, we can each have, we, there can be room to differ here on views here. But where we talked about that before in the class and then where I would land even now is, um, all right, however I do this, there's some language in here that is really strong. <laughs> um, so whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Those who resist will incur judgment. I mean, <laughs> anyway, whatever we do, we've got to kind of find a way to put this through that grid. And I don't know. Um, yeah. So anyway, there's some there's some tough decisions that we're facing right now and that uh, pastors face uh, how to how to work some of this. Um, a few more pieces of context here. Uh, it's worth clarifying. I don't know that Paul is intending here to give like a full bodied theology of how to handle government and the and the the ethical dilemmas that come out of it. So. It's kind of like this is one side of the equation, but the rest of the equation would be, you can get some stuff like Acts 4, we ought to obey God rather than men. Um, all right, so, you know, we tend, we, we struggle through some of those tensions. I don't know that this chapter is supposed to cover all of those bases, but it gives a core part of it. 
And the other thing I would say here that's interesting for context that was kind of, oh, interesting, new to me, he here in verse uh, 7 gives two different words for taxes. So he'll say, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom a revenue is owed. And these are two different words, taxes versus revenue. And there was basis for that in the context. I mean, so what we know of history, and that can be pretty definitively proven, a distinction between direct taxes versus what we might do like um, a duty kind of, you know, that on top, like a customs duty kind of concept. So those are the two things that are here. Well, in contemporary, the contemporary framework, uh, Nero had just put up a new exorbitant tax. So the taxes in Rome were huge, and this was kind of a political issue of the time, was eventually going to lead to some unrest in Rome. And it seems that part of the reason Paul is going after this here is because he really wants to make sure that the Roman believers are not going to join in or be part of the, the leaders in the way for the unrest. So anyway, I think that's interesting. I was going to toss in one more application for this section. Um, a long time ago, having conversations with Dr. Collins, he said something along the lines of, you know, revolution sometimes happens, but believers should pretty much never be the vanguard of that. And uh, I, with an increase of time, I think that that's really good. <laughs> it happens sometimes, but you don't want to be the person leading the way to do that. You don't want to be, and we don't want to be known as, as a group, as rabble rousers or people that go after government. Um, so anyway, there's that. Standing behind the government authority is, is the authority of God. And we would put through that through categories of common grace. God provides civil government so that, that things don't fall apart. You don't want to live somewhere where there's not a strong civil government to bring about justice. Um, so those kinds of concepts. All right, I'll keep on moving unless you have questions. Uh, only other thing I was going to mention here, I, I think I've already said that, was here, uh, taxes to whom taxes are owed, probably is intertextuality back to Mark 12, 13 to 17. This is that pericope with Jesus saying, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, give to God what belongs to God, so what is God's. So there's probably some intertextuality there or some links there that Again, I'm, I'm very fascinated by epistles that are going back to traditions drawn from Jesus and his teaching. Okay, I don't know that I'll say much about this section because I already kind of did. But owe no, one, owe no one anything except to love each other. Love fulfills the law. Uh, there's intertextuality here. Obviously, love your neighbor as yourself. That's Leviticus, is it like, I think, 1918? Uh, 19.1. No, it's 18, 1918. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And then this has echoes drawn in Galatians. Jesus does this. Jesus says, you know, what is the greatest command? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Um, so anyway, you've got a strong, strong link across all of that. I was interested here, a point someone made uh, you notice the knots here. You shall not steal, not covet. Um, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. Are linked down to no wrong. And so the idea is you would not do any of these things. You would, summarizing that, not do wrong to a neighbor. And therefore, by not doing wrong, not doing any of these things, you're fulfilling the law. Um, so anyway, that fits into the general framework we've talked about with here with... With Paul, Paul's not against law. Paul's not falsifying or nullifying or abrogating law. In fact, his other argument is, or his fuller argument is that we need to fulfill the law, which is really interesting. After he's talked about the role of the law, Jesus Christ instead fulfills that Christ is the end of the law. But then turn around and there is a sense of our having a moral responsibility to fulfill it, live it out, the intentions of God expressed in the law through love. Um, anyway, it's neat. It's rich. His conception of law, you, you do not want to stuff the New Testament or Paul in a box. You know, Paul told us the law is canceled now. You just can't do a ham-fisted thing like that. It's, it's very nuanced and thick. 
all the way through here. Okay, um, yeah, let me talk about the chat here. This is interesting. Since God does not contradict himself, as a, if a government is contradicting the law of God, what point do we recognize that there is legislation from human government inspired by Satan and not God? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could put two hours into that. I mean, it's it's hard. It's complicated. Um, when I say some things like the point that... Uh, how, how do I say this? What do you say? Every... every governmental reality is always it, it's never it's not it, it's always just a stopgap measure it's it's never following the ideals of god's ethics at all and yet if we think something like uh I'll, I'll give you an example american prohibition would it be good if we could put away alcohol yeah it'd be great if we could make alcohol illegal um in terms of you know alcohol is a recreational beverage but you're not going to be able to pull that off. You just can't pull it off. Because as soon as you do it, it all goes underground. There's a bunch of stuff like this that it's like, what we're looking at is humanity does not have the power to set up functional societies. So we just do the, we just muddle through. That's it. Anyway, we're in a permanent state of muddling through. Um, so yeah, we're very much living for a future time and a future place. We recognize that um, there are laws in place in the American context, abortion, that are just deeply broken and hideous, horrifying. Um, so we live with that stuff. You know, at the same time, you don't want to live in a, you wouldn't want to just vacuum government out of that. That would be horrifying in itself too. It, I don't want to go too far down this direction, but the discussion we had earlier last year around the quarantine stuff, basically that I think the conclusion we came around to was you could reach a point where you would say, you know, we really, the church or the government should not be shutting down churches. So we're going to need to meet at some point, maybe for a couple of weeks, maybe for a couple of months, we could say, hey, this is ne necessary. But when we get into the year range, really, um, and yet, on the other hand, we do everything we can to be respectful and to honor the intentions of the government. So I'm more sympathetic to groups that have chosen to wear masks, do the social distancing thing, like you check every box you can possibly check. But you say at the end of the day, we are going to need to have church. <laughs> so anyway, you, you don't just completely give in, but you're going to do this as respectfully as you possibly can. Um, here's a great question. Where does this put the reformers who revolt against the church slash government of their time? Things like the Glorious Revolution. You know that historically the Glorious Revolution didn't turn out real well. Um, just if you do the, the broader time frame so yeah i don't know in the case of like martin luther you've got his church state but actually eventually his magistrate is supporting him i don't know these things are messy i am anyway in my own context here's a comment because of the american revolution the american press and the american framework tends to always cheer the revolt. <laughs> they always cheer the, the the revolution, and then if you, but if you watch things like the Arab Spring is the most recent example. The Western press was cheering them, but it turned out really really bad, and now most of those people are in a worse state than they were before. So anyway, to revolt is like rolling the dice. You don't know what's going to come. You're you, it's like you roll the dice, and three out of the six sides of the dice say you die. And the other three six, three sides say it. Two sides say it might be okay, and one side says it might come out better. So you throw the dice. Well, I'm not going to throw that dice until things are really bad. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, it's like more than likely what you're going to get is worse than what you had. And on that, I want to be I want to be really careful. Um, yeah, as some ethicists would say, since authorities are established by God, moral authorities in government have the authority to overthrow immoral authorities in government. Yeah, I mean, you can think of like a Bonhoeffer. And so I think we can look in that situation and say, yeah, recognize that you're, you, you, you can, you're going to probably get killed in the process, and he did. 
uh, you're paying a high price. So don't go there until you're really ready to lay your life down and until we're really talking about life and death kind of stuff. Um, but I don't really want, I wouldn't want the church to be at the vanguard of, you know, yeah. So it's good. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> None of this is easy. It's really good. Good discussions there. I'll keep on moving, um, but excellent discussions. Uh, verse 11 and following. We have, interesting, we have put on, put off language. And uh, try this. I won't do this now, but here. So uh, put on the armor of light sounds to me like Ephesians 5 and a combination of Ephesians 5 and 6, right? Ephesians 5, walk in the light, don't live in the orgies and drunkenness. That sounds like Ephesians 5. But the put on the armor sounds like Ephesians 6. So I've got some other stuff where I have echoes that are pretty neat. And then the put on language sounds like Ephesians 4. <laughs> um, put on in contrast over here, but put on the Lord Jesus. Uh, and again, that's anyway, that's that's neat for just understanding what I'm talking about is put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm talking about is total life transformation. And that can be summed up in terms of him, the person union with Christ. Um, so, yeah, there's some neat things that are going on there. Chapter 14, Dr. Oberlin will talk about this. But, well, anyway, we'll see how, how he goes with it. And I'm looking forward to learning from him uh, and getting it. But I would say my basic understanding, so there's discussion about whether 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 are parallel to 14, Romans 14 or whether they're different. I understand them as different. I understand them as related. But uh, in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, the issue is meat being offered to idols. Here, the context probably seems to or sounds like we're talking about Jewish mores. In other words, here, the person eats only vegetables. It's a kosher thing. Right, so the context here sounds like a person's conscience is bound about kosher food versus the other person who believes they can eat anything. Right. Uh, also, you get into questions of days. So I think that also fits the Jewish thing. One person esteems all days alike, kind of gives you the sense of um, do you, you know, Jewish holidays or the Jewish feast patterns. Um, so anyway, when you do all of that as a context for this, it's related to 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, but different, similar but different. And um, I think that helps us interpret this. Anyway, I think I'll leave the rest of this to Dr. Oberlin. You can just see language of judgment, which I think is kind of echoing way back when we saw the justification language that has been uh, mostly, mostly we've moved on from. But there's this justification language. Oh, here's one more. Do you see the blue? Unclean versus clean. So I think that also represents the Jewish, the Jewish kosher issue with food here, as opposed to 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 that's doing meat offered to idols. There's no indication in, in here, in this context, that there's any meat offered to idols issue going on. Um, Another thing that's helpful to know or helped me to understand, it's obvious as soon as you see it, but that the chapter break moving from chapter 14 continues down into 15. So it just keeps on going. So this is a bad chapter break, basically. Um, and it probably is going to go down to here. So that seems to be the end of the break there. Uh, this is an interesting intertextuality, Psalm 69 because it comes up other places in Romans. So uh, Psalm 69, which is messianic. And another case of intertextuality is going to be actually now a string of intertextuality down here. Uh, so what's interesting about these, this is the string of intertextuality showing that the Gentiles were, were part of God's plan all the way back in the Old Testament. This is not a New Testament thing. This is not a thing that Paul came up with but this is an ancient thing all the way back in the Old Testament. And what's interesting here is that you draw from 2 Samuel, Psalm 18, Deuteronomy 32, Isaiah, um, basically the, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. So he pulls from each one of the sections to show that the whole thing has, the, has this concept in there. 
Uh, my favorite of these probably is Isaiah 11. It's bad to have favorites, but Isaiah 11 is this beautiful messianic passage. And um, so it's rich, though, to say that the Messiah and his connections into what we're talking about here with Gentile salvation. And there are other contexts. Try looking, try looking for intertextuality in Romans from Isaiah 52. We've got a couple of 52 and 53. A couple of links like that that are beautiful because we're doing New Covenant Messianic stuff. Down here in verse 13, uh, the God of hope, that is an echo of chapter 5. Remember, the uh, hope does not make us ashamed because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts even when we are facing tribulation, as well as Romans 8. So this concept of hope came up pretty significantly earlier, and in Romans 8, linked to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit brings hope because he will regenerate us, and so the whole creation waits in hope. Um, so that's that kind of concluding prayer um, is, I think, it's echoes or summarizing from stuff that has come before. And the only other thing, see, look, we've covered the whole book. What do you know? No, hardly. Um, oh, two things. Yeah, the, the section, the last part of chapter 15, like verse 19, so that from Jerusalem all over the way around to Illyricum, that is like the northern, northwestern part of modern-day Greece. And um, it is to say that Paul's missionary efforts have extended broadly around the ancient world. Uh, so then now what he's saying in down into 24 is his vision to go into Spain and keep on going. So now he's going to talk about the, uh, the, the, Gentile, or the Gentile offering in an attempt to try to bring together Jew and Gentile, what otherwise could be some, some tensions between them. Um, I think this is really neat. This is what I was alluding to earlier. This bit of under, intertextuality, those who have never been told of him will see, those who have never heard will understand. That's drawn from Isaiah 52, 15. And in context there, he talks about all nations. Isaiah 52, all nations. And then what leads next is 53. So the suffering serpent. Um, so that's a neat context and how some of those pieces go together. Uh, chapter 16, I would just comment one or two phenomenon, phenomenon, one or two phenomenon on that phenomenon, whatever. Um, verse three, you have Priscilla and Aquila to tell you that there are definitely Jews in Rome. So you've got several names in here that tell us we've got something, we've got Jewish, content, Jewish people in the group. We've got several things to give us indication of definitely Greek people within the group or Gentiles within the group. And a couple of indications that we're probably talking about like servants. So some of the names in here are typical servant names, almost like job names, uh, including verse 22, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Um, that sometimes gives people pause because, oh, I thought Paul wrote this. Anyway, it's an explicit statement of Paul's secretary or amanuensis. So he's dictating the letter. The secretary is writing this down. But in any case, you've got things like in the next verse, you've got a city treasurer all the way to people that are servants. So I think what you're getting out of the, the list of names in chapter 16 is just a little window into it's like a church directory. But the church directory is including Jews, Gentiles, servants, wealthy people. It's including a, a broad variety, and it's showing you a little window into an ancient church and all of the variety that would be represented in that. So that's neat. And then in terms of our interpretation of Romans, it, it leaves us with uh, an awareness that Paul knows these believers, that he's well acquainted with them. Uh, if I can say or get away with saying two other things, um, I would like you to know the obedience of faith pattern. And that happens twice in Romans. It happens at the beginning, at the end. So it has the, this is for you, Brother Kenneth, uh, the sense of an ecclusia, inclusio. Um, so here we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. And then here, Romans 16, which is taking you out of the book now, uh, to bring about the obedience of faith. And that is very, that is very apropos for the whole framework of Romans, 
because how does obedience to the law come about? How does obedience to God's moral expectations come about? How do we actually live in a way that pleases him? Or how do we do the perfect and acceptable, pleasing will of God? Only by faith, because salvation is by faith. However, salvation by faith does not mean antinomianism either. So it's not just a subscription to some information, but it's obedient faith. Or the Ephesians 2, where is workmanship, which God created in Christ Jesus so that we would live out good works. I mean, he wants us to live out righteous living. So Christianity is not just a change of legal status. It's more than that. It is actual living it out. And that that's significantly placed right at the beginning, obedience of faith for the sake of all his nations, uh, for the sake of his name among all the nations. So if I'm looking at this language in 1.5, and then this is the, the conclusion of the book, uh, 16 at the very end. And let's read it. To him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. I mean, this sounds so much like that opening section, the apostleship, Jesus, Paul's apostleship. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for age, for long ages, this concept of the mystery is something that has been revealed that you, you probably would not have gotten. Well, that sounds like chapters 9 through 11. Here's the mystery that God has used the hardness of the Jews to bring salvation to the Gentiles. So here's a surprise, a, a, a beautiful turn of God's salvific plan, salvation history. But it has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been named, made known to all the nations. Through the prophetic writings, um, it, it, it was it, he's showing you it was kept secret. In other words, this is a progression upon revelation. And yet it's in the Old Testament. It's there, which I think supports all of the intertextuality he's constantly doing. This is not contrary to the law. This is not against the Old Testament. It's there. It's in the prophetic writings. Now it's been made known to all nations, noticing the Jew and Gentile motif that's all the way through the book, you know, to the Jew first and also to the Greek language in chapter one. But it's constant, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, all the way through. So that inclusive language that we keep on seeing, made known to all the nations. According to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith, language that we just saw as an ecclesia back there in chapter 1, to the only wise God, that sounds like chapter 11, who has known the mind of the Lord, his wisdom is beyond our understanding. Be glory forever and ever, forevermore through Jesus Christ, from him, to through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Um, so anyway, I mean, he's just summed up. You can just go through the book and pick pieces all the way through the book, and it's it's rich. Um, that's it for today, and that's it for our kind of exposition chapter by chapter effort to go through the book. I, I hope this has been profitable. I will uh, I will take some of the notes that I've worked through and edit them up further, and then I can just give you a single document that hopefully is helpful to you. And uh, the only other things I would say, you know, I would say among the commentary literature, if you want to go further, uh, Schreiner. I found to be the most helpful in terms of concision um, and workable, not being excessive. Um, but anyway, this book is overwhelming and beautiful <laughs> and has really uh, caused me to appreciate its centrality in the Pauline corpus and then just of the New Testament at large. So I've been blessed by working through it with you. Thank you for your patience and uh, listening through my droning on and on. And uh, we'll look forward to learning from Dr. Oberlin next time and then concluding it out with John Cheek next week. So, okay. Thank you all. I'll let you go. And we'll see you uh, next time when we come back on Monday.